for we ask it in Christ. Amen. Amen. I always love uh, familiar stories like uh, the, the 10 lepers who were healed. Most people know this one. And every year, Belinda does a whiz bang giant Bible school. And for years, when our, uh, of course, when our nieces and nephews were younger, they would come and stay with us so they could go to those Bible schools. Uh, the worst part of that was that they would walk around the house singing those songs all day. <laughs> and one year, the, the theme for that whole week uh, were the uh, miracles of Jesus, and this was one of them. And the kids were singing a song, and I'll, I'll, I'm not going to sing the song for you, but I'll, I'll do the chorus. And join in if you know it. No. <laughs> um, it was... Jesus healed 10 lepers on that day. Only one came back. <laughs> Only one came back. Only one came back. Jesus healed 10 shepherds on that, uh, lepers on that day. Anyway, so they were singing this, but Hannah, who was four, was walking through the house and she was singing this. Only one came back. Only one came back. Only one came back. Jesus shot 10 shepherds on that day. <laughs> An entirely different story, <laughs> uh, and very memorable. And now that you know she's in her thirties, we still give her a really hard time about that. <laughs> I guarantee you, Jesus did not shoot ten shepherds. <laughs> that has nothing to do with the sermon, by the way. <laughs> that was. That was because Belinda and I had been walking around all week, and as we pass each other in the house, we go, Jesus shot two shepherds. <laughs> and we'll probably do that again at, uh, later today. Following the Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church had the Counter Reformation. Uh, if you remember that from your history, and there was a uh, St. Ignatius Loyola. Who did more than have a school named after him. Uh, he was the founder of the Jesuit order and uh, he wrote a, a book that that is a classic it's called Spiritual Exercises and these were meant to be used in retreats and to bolster your your faith and one of the things that he did and I, I've done this in retreats is that he has people use their imagination. That sounds inviting already, doesn't it? To use your imagination in prayer. And that in this time of contemplation, that in reading the scripture, you would place yourself into that story. And it makes that story come alive to people who do this in ways that they had never imagined before. This imaginative prayer allows you to, to see the old familiar things in new details, and it'll raise new questions, and it brings new revelations from the word for you as Jesus speaks to you. Now, personally, when I've done this, I found it easier for me to do it in a parable. Yeah, I would, it's easy for me to put myself into a parable uh, where I'm the older brother in the prodigal side or something like that, or uh, the man beaten laying on the side of the road who's rescued by a Samaritan. But our text today is not a parable. It's a story of an extremely miraculous healing by Jesus. He healed not one leper, but 10, 10 who cried out for mercy. Now, if you and I are to use our imagination and put ourselves into the story, we don't have a whole lot of options as to who we're going to be. Uh, you're either going to be a leper or Jesus. That's, that's it. So if we're a, 
if we imagine ourselves as one of the lepers in this story, what do you really know about leprosy? And I asked myself that earlier in the week. Just, uh, I asked myself that on the way here today. No. <laughs> uh, and so I, I read a lot about leprosy. And that disease, you know, uh, there are a lot of misconceptions. That disease still exists today. There are 200,000 new cases every year in the world. But it's no longer called leprosy. For the most part, it's known in the medical world as Hansen's disease. Because in 1874, Dr. Gerard Hansen discovered the cause of leprosy. Discovered that it was caused by a bacterium named by him, Microbacterium leprae. That discovery led to treatments and it eventually led to a cure for leprosy. But even today, among the poorest and the marginalized in the world, they don't have those medications. <coughs> they still suffer the horrors of the disease. <laughs> That's a sermon for another time. But in first century Palestine, none of that was known. There were no treatments. There were no cures. <laughs> Leprosy is a chronic infectious disease. It's uh, manifested by skin lesions and nerve damage. And it affects the eyes. It affects skin, of course. It uh, affects the nervous system more than anything else. Symptoms include the, the, uh, the patchy blotches on the, of the skin and reduced sensation and eventual numbness in the extremities and weakness. <clears throat> and eventually, if the leprosy doesn't kill you, the disease you get because of the leprosy will kill you. But the worst part of the disease is the numbness, the destruction of the nerves. You know, people have a misconception, they'll see pictures of lepers who are missing fingers or hands or feet. And they'll, they think, oh, leprosy caused those things to wither and fall off, and it does not. The numbness leads to horrific injuries. If you think how you sense the world around you, that's gone. They do not have a sense of touch. They don't know what's sharp. They don't know what's hot. Often they're injured and they don't even know it. Now, are any of you familiar with Father Damien and the work he did in Hawaii with lepers? <clears throat> he was canonized for it. He is Saint Damien. Uh, uh, he tells a story about the horror of them not being able to feel when he said he was trying to open a rusty lock with the key and he couldn't turn the key. And a young man with leprosy said, let me try father. And he grabbed the key and he turned it and it opened. But then Father Damien noticed blood on the floor and he looked at the young man's hand and the flesh had been torn all the way down to the bone. No sense of feel. And you think the horror of open wounds, infections, the loss of fingers, hands, feet, legs, that's what causes that. And Father Damien said the stench of the disease is almost unbearable. He took up smoking a pipe so that it would mask the smell. And lepers lose their mobility. And their muscles atrophy. And then they fall prey to insects and rodents. And I'm not saying this to gross you out. We just need to understand that. What pain 
and hard as a leper in first century Palestine experienced. <clears throat> and that's only the physical. That's only the physical aspect of the disease, <clears throat> which is enough. But then there's social and religious aspects to it as well. Because the disease is contagious, infected people were removed from contact with anyone. They were removed from their families, sometimes forcibly removed from their families. They were cast out of cities. <coughs> they were separated from everyone and everything that they knew and that they loved including their livelihood. They had nothing. Lepers could not interact with non-lepers at all. When someone approached, and I know you all know this, they had to shout, unclean, unclean. They couldn't go to synagogues. They couldn't go to the temple. They were cut off from everyone. And religiously, Judaism at that time, and some Judaism and Christianity today still believe somewhere in the backs of their minds that diseases are caused by your sins. And since these sins are punishments from God, then the worst disease imaginable must be because of a sin that was unimaginable. And so you are cut off. They were absolutely cut off from everything. They were the living dead. And still are in some parts of the world. And because humans are social animals, outcast lepers would come together. And they lived in colonies. That way they could help care for one another. So these 10 lepers that Jesus encounters are bound together by one thing. A shared misery that's almost incomprehensible to us. If there's anything good about leprosy, it had a great democratizing effect on the people who had it. Didn't matter whether you were rich or you were poor or a Jew or a Samaritan. Didn't matter what you were. If you were a leper, you were welcome in the colony. And we find one Samaritan among the ten today. In their pain, in their misery, they called out to Jesus, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Master's not a name you usually see associated with Jesus. Very few people call him master. But it indicates that they understood that he was someone who had extreme authority. They had undoubtedly heard stories about Jesus. They knew that he was a preacher, he was a teacher, that he was an exorcist, and that he was a healer. And most of them knew the only cure for leprosy would be a miracle. One like Miriam received or Naaman received in the Old Testament. And they may have even heard stories about Jesus healing the leper. If you remember in, in uh, Matthew chapter 8, after the Sermon on the Mount, said Jesus coming down the mountain and a leper comes and kneels before him. He said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out and touched the leper. That's a shocker. He touched the leper and said, I choose to do that. Be clean. And he sent him to the priest to be declared clean. They may have known that story. They may have heard it. 
But whatever they knew, it was enough for them to believe that Jesus could heal them. <laughs> and that's why they went to meet him. They were bold. And they cried out for mercy. So this is where we place ourselves in the story. You have something now to help you understand the character that you are. And I'm, I'm sure it's been pointed out to you more than once that Jesus never heals people the same way twice. If you're blind, you might get mud in your eyes. You know, uh, or you might just get touched or just spoken to. The same with deaf people. You know, he might stick, stick his fingers in your ears. You know, he never heals people the same way twice. There's no formula for healing. In Matthew, Jesus touched the leper and said, be cleansed. In this one, Jesus doesn't tell them they're cleansed. He doesn't touch them. They're still at a distance. And he said, go show yourselves to the priest. Didn't tell them what was going to happen. But they went. They went. He simply said, go, and they went. And some people will say, desperate people do desperate things. But this was not an act of desperation. This was an act of faith. They believed that Jesus could cure them. He said, go, they went. Now, there'll be a lot of sermons preached today on this lesson. And they'll use the 10 as a model of faith. And when they do, they are preaching the gospel. That's true. And some will preach that the, the one former leper who returned to give praise and thanks to God distributed, exhibited faith far beyond what the others were showing. And they would be right, and they would be, that's true, and they would be preaching the gospel as well. That's not our sermon today. Although I would add to that, um, I always hate it when uh, people say, and the other nine had no gratitude. Do you think if you were a leper and living like that and you were healed, you would have no gratitude? No. They were excited. They were happy. They were grateful. And they did what Jesus said. They're on their way to see the priest. The disobedient one is the Samaritan who comes back. <laughs> They're doing what they were told to do. But had they returned, had the nine returned, they would have had much more than physical healing. The Samaritan did return to glorify God and thank God, received more than the physical healing of his leprosy. When Jesus said to him, your faith has made you well, he used a different word for that healing. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has made you well. Sozokin is the Greek. Don't worry, there's no quiz later. But that word implies a wellness that makes one whole. It's not the word he used for healing early on. He had been healed, made whole physically and spiritually. Sometimes, uh, so Sozokin is translated as saved. But King James I mean, has the best translation of this passage. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. And if someone were to preach this today, that would be the truth and part of the gospel message, but that's not this sermon. Those were for free. <laughs> Side trips. 
But with this knowledge and this understanding of leprosy, if we place ourselves into the story, our understanding of the mercy and the healing they receive, it's more understandable. And it may help us come to grips and to understand more clearly the mercy that we have received. That's one of the benefits of placing yourself into the story. We, like them, have received mercy. And as wonderful and as grateful as that can make us feel, that's not this sermon either. <laughs> I'd like to leave that behind for a moment. And I want you to use your imagination in a different way. I want you to put on the sandals of Jesus in this story. I want to put on the sandals of Jesus in this story, and there are reasons why. Now, Jesus is walking toward Jerusalem for the last time. He knows what's ahead. He's told his disciples twice already. He'll tell them one more time in chapter 18, which lies ahead. But they don't comprehend what's going on. He's on his way to pour out his life for humanity, for the whole world. And as he enters this village, 10 lepers call out to him from a distance. Jesus, master, have pity on us. Have mercy on us. And the next thing that Luke shares with us, when Jesus saw them, he said, Go and show yourselves to the priest. They are yelling, which is auditory, and then we're told Jesus saw them. We're not told Jesus heard them. That's what was happening. They're yelling, and we're told Jesus saw them, which we already knew because they met Jesus in the verse prior. This is more than just the optic nerve at work. Jesus saw them. He saw their misery. He saw their grief. He saw their pain. He saw their faith. And he immediately moved to heal them. He could see, he could understand. And what would any of us want more in the world than for Jesus to see us in our misery and to understand? Jesus knew what they had lost. He knew the hopelessness. He knew their grief. I want you to imagine yourself as Jesus. I want to imagine myself as Jesus because that's the ministry to which we're called. One of the things that Bishop Jones loves to say in a sermon, as I've heard it a bunch of times, is what does God expect of us? Jesus. <laughs> That's the expectation. Those are the sandals we should put on. Our world right now and everyone in it that we know is emerging from a horrible pandemic. A lot of things were lost. And I'm sure you've noticed things are different as we're coming out. And one of the things that I've noticed that drives me crazy in myself and in others have any of you experienced more anger out there than usual? There's a lot of anger out there. There's a lot of anger in here. It's the emotion du jour. <laughs> Help yourselves. There's a lot. But I want you to understand this. Anger is always a secondary emotion. Something happened first to make you angry, to make them angry. A lot is lost. 
There's a lot of pain. There's unimaginable grief in the world. And there are a lot of things I'm mad about. We lost so much. We lost millions of people. And there were jobs and industries and churches that vanished. I was telling Father Bill before the service, I one of the things I was so angry about, and I got the voice it at a meeting at uh, Advent Health at the hospital there to some of the medical people. During the pandemic, clergy were boxed out. We couldn't minister. Churches were closed. We understood that. But we couldn't visit people in the hospitals who were dying. And a, a dear special needs friend who died, I could not go see him. Didn't matter who I talked to. I talked to administrators. I talked to chaplains. Chaplains were boxed out too. I could not get into the hospital to see him. He had no family. He died utterly alone. And I'm mad. Everyone has lost something. And we don't know how to deal with it. Where do I take the grief? Where do we take our grief? Where does the world go with this? Everybody can say, my world is not like it was. I lost things. <clears throat> and I'm mourning and I have no out. No one sees me. No one hears me. But when you're in the sandals of Jesus, he saw them. By the power of the spirit that's within us and by prayer, we can see them through the eyes of Jesus. If we're willing to. Now, COVID-19 and the leprosy are very, very different diseases, but they both have caused <clears throat> unimaginable grief, pain, and suffering. But as Jesus in the story, and in the story of this world, are you willing to see them and to help them and to listen to them? To be a wounded healer. Now, I don't know. You know, I can't stand here and say, all right, this is our pastoral care class, and I'm going to tell you this. This is what you do when you're out there, and this is what you do. But I can tell you what not to do. Don't exchange anger for anger. When anger comes at you, take it. Give it to Christ. And then do your best to find out what their anger is coming from. Where are they hurt? <clears throat> What's their pain that's causing that anger? You just have to be willing. And, and sometimes, almost every time, you won't know what to do, and that's okay. That's okay. Sometimes just being there and listening. I want to hear. I want to hear. I want to see. I want to understand. And as they share, I think we will also find healing as they share with us when we are in the ministry of Christ. You know, think of the, the person in scripture, aside from Jesus, who suffered the most, Job. If you go to read the book of Job, and he loses everything. Still praises God, still worships God, still knows that God is just. And when his comforters come, they sit with him in silence for three days. And I remember my, <laughs> my pastoral care professor said, 
and they were perfect up to that point. <laughs> and then they opened their mouths and messed everything up. You don't have to tell them why they're suffering, just be willing to listen. And you don't have to listen and, and judge them. Just listen. <laughs> Give people that chance to unburden themselves. And yeah, the, this small group here and the group at home, we're not going to change the world. But it's like a, sort of an underground movement. The people that you listen to may in turn listen to others who may in turn listen to others. If we're willing to see with the eyes of Jesus, we are his hand, we are his feet. We are his ears and his eyes. And we are in his sandals doing his ministry. So the challenge for all of us is to be willing, to be willing and to ask Christ to go with us to walk into the pain and the misery of this world and through us allow Christ to alleviate as much of it as can be done. Amen. Amen.